as we talked about last time, the colonists in Britain's North American Empire are fairly happy. Essentially, they rule themselves. Uh, Britain's practicing this salutary neglect system where the British monarchy rarely steps into colonial affairs. Basically, you have these 13 colonial assemblies, uh, the representative bodies, you know, the degree of representation is going to differ for each colony, but each representative body will make the decisions for the people of its colony. So if you need a road built, if you need new schools established, whatever, the colonial assembly will determine, make the laws, will determine the public works that are need to be built. They're going to make the decisions for the people of the colony. So people of the colony choose the representatives and the representatives make most of the decisions for the colonies. You know, again, some towns will have their own judicial systems and, you know, you'll have local governments. But the main government decision makings are going to be at the hands of these colonial assemblies. And again, we've talked about some of these colonial assemblies before. Uh, General Court, Massachusetts, House of Burgesses in Virginia. So you have these decision makers that if something happens, Indian attack on the frontier, they're going to be the ones to assemble the militia, go after them. If there's uh, a law that needs to be passed, they're going to make this decision. And the only thing that uh, the crown is going to do is going to appoint governors to each of these colonial assemblies. And occasionally they'll step up, make decisions. But the vast majority of these colonial governors are going to recognize, if I just let these guys do what they're going to do, it's a lot easier for me. And uh, again, it's not like the colonists are doing anything to upset the British prior to 1763. They're like a tenant that um, you don't have any problems with, no, doesn't create noise, pays their rent on time. Occasionally they might do something you don't like, like smoking, and in this case smuggling will happen occasionally. But for the most part, they, uh, uh, they're, good, um, they're good tenants. Well, uh, as we also talked about, the British aren't going to extract much in the way of money from these colonists. Um, basically, the only taxation, internal taxation, that's going to happen is going to happen at the hands of these colonial assemblies. Again, you know, you need a road build or whatever. These guys are going to take care of it. The uh, British do not internally tax. The only time they're going to take money out of the colonists is in the form of internal and external duties. So whenever imports, or I'm sorry, uh, import and export duties. So whenever goods come into the colonies, you know, British duty collector will collect money. Uh, whenever things go out, they'll collect money as well. And again, the colonists like this. It's, um, you know, we handle our own affairs. You guys protect us, and we give you a little bit of money when we uh, send raw goods out. So people are happy with their place in the empire. They're happy with the king. The king has just gotten rid of uh, the French rivals to the north. No longer have to worry about security. Uh, the English have taken Spanish Florida. And again, uh, the English rule the eastern half of North America. Yay, King George. Again, you're going to see multiple statues of King George put up throughout the colonies. This is one that's put up in Bowling Green, New York. But as we all know, just a short dozen or so years after these statues are put up, these same statues are going to be ripped to the ground. And we're going to see a majority of the colonists are going to be in favor of independence. It, it actually might take a little bit longer than a dozen years for the majority to be in favor of independence, but more and more colonists are going to say, we no longer want to be a part of this British Empire. So we're going to talk about what happens in this time period from 1763 to 1776, 1777, that's going to turn the colonists away from Britain. Well, one thing that you can say will lead to this American Revolution isn't something that uh, starts to happen in 1763, and it's actually something that had been sort of happening in the background, uh, uh, just his historically, uh, something that had been permeating American culture and European culture and really world culture at large uh, throughout the 1700s. And this is something called the Enlightenment, all right? So this isn't something new to 1763. This is just something that's been happening for a while. Late 1600s it starts, early 1700s. There's not a definitive date for when the Enlightenment starts, but for our purposes, let's say right around 1700 or so. Um, what this Enlightenment was was an intellectual movement where you saw the old way of doing things questioned, okay? You saw people look at the way things had always been done, and they sort of took this scientific attitude to ask, 
is this the right way of doing things? Can we do this better? And you're going to see this sort of questioning attitude towards economics, science, politics, religion, and a wide variety of things. So why does this enlightenment occur? And you know, why does it occur right around end of the 1600s, early 1700s? And why, why is this going to lead to these changes in these American colonies? Well, the Enlightenment's going to come about because, you know, late 1600s, early 1700s, you see a new class of people emerge in Europe, all right? Prior to the discovery of the New World, you basically had the poor, which are going to make up the vast majority of people in Europe. You had, you know, people without land, peasants, they would have to work for this landed aristocracy. These are people that inherited land usually from you know great 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 grandpa or something who maybe got the land you know when Roman Empire split up you know they they started staking their claim to certain land maybe they uh, you know great 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 grandfather times 20 was a king of this land gave up you know some of their power whenever you see these various areas uh, in Europe start unifying whatever the case the small percentage of Europeans, maybe 5%, that might be a little bit too much, were aristocrats, people born into wealth, these landed, property people, and generally those with, in this top 5% or so, these, these landed aristocrats, they're the only ones that ever received an education, and the other 95% of people, they're peasants, they can't afford an education, and basically they're destined for a life of manual labor. So. You're um, born without money. At a young age, you're going to start helping your family, who's also poor, probably working for this landed guy down the down the road. Uh, and you're um, you know farming at a very young age, and you're not going to have a chance to make your way out of this because you don't receive an education. You don't uh, you don't learn anything besides how to farm, how to work for somebody else. So you can't really question the way think why things are the way they are why that guy has money because you don't have the time because you're constantly working you don't have the education to question things and again the people up the top they kind of like it that way they like being in charge simply because they're born into power well something's going to happen right around the time of the discovery of the new world we're going to see the emergence of this merchant class or maybe this middle class you would think of upper upper middle class lower upper class something like that but we're going to start seeing a new group of people with money uh, will start emerging in Europe. And this is going to happen throughout Europe. A lot of people put France as the heart of the Enlightenment, and I think that's a, a, a fair place to put it. But what basically happens is some people start profiting from New World wealth. Okay, So you would have maybe a French fisherman, some guy that's it's really poor. He has a fishing boat. Now he goes over to the New World. Maybe he gets some fur, comes back makes some money selling this to elites, buys a second boat, then he starts his fur trading empire. And this guy, before the discovery of the New World, his family had always been poor fishermen, but now they're starting to bring in some money, okay? Or maybe you had poor Englishmen who, um, you know, uh, could barely afford anything. He starts seeing this tobacco coming from Virginia and later Maryland and, and uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, that type of place. And maybe he starts being the middleman when the tobacco arrives back in England. Maybe he's a guy who starts a cigar factory to start turning this tobacco into something the elites can smoke. Now he starts making a little bit of money, his factory grows, and he turns out to have money, uh, you know, where his great-grandfather didn't, his father didn't. Well, these new money people, and, and I'm just giving a couple examples, you know, maybe jewelers uh, making money off of the silver coming back from the Americas, something like that. But these new merchants are going to start to have leisure time. So prior to um, uh, this point, you're poor, you're working all the time. Now you're going to have this new money people have leisure time, and they're going to have money to educate their children, all right? So this isn't somebody that is Sir or Duke or anything like that. Somebody who inherited their wealth, they earned their wealth, or at least their grandfather or their father or their great-grandfather or something earned the wealth. So they're new money people. A lot of these people are entrepreneurs. Some are self-made men. Again, some 
um, you know, second, third generation inherited uh, from their father at the start of the business, but they're not born into it in, in, in the fact that, you know, you see those aristocrats who have gotten just sort of this generational wealth. All right, so you got these new money people, these entrepreneurs, leisure time, and education. They have the, the leisure time and they have the money to educate themselves and their children. Well, what these guys are going to do is they're going to start meeting in places like this. This would be a coffee house. I believe this was a coffee house in, in Britain. And they're going to start spending this wealth, and they're going to start discussing things with fellow merchants, you know, fellow entrepreneurs, fe fellow new money people. And what's going to come out of these conversations are new ideas about, about how we do things. Again, as we mentioned, economic, scientific, religion, politics, this type of thing. Some of these guys will start questioning the way the economic system has worked in Europe and around the world. Some people are going to say, the way things are done right now, it's almost impossible to trade directly between Britain and France or uh, France and Spain. We didn't talk about it very much, but you would see occasional trades between uh, the various nations. But for the most part, these nations tried to keep the money within in their own borders. They didn't allow you know their citizens to easily trade with foreign nations. Well, some of these guys uh, are going to start discussing ideas like, what about we have free trade? What if we allow each nation to trade with one another? Wouldn't that be more beneficial for everybody as a whole? Because if we can get in the cheapest good... Uh, goods instead of you know having to uh, buy exclusively from within our nation's colonies or within our nation itself, that would make our lives better, um, wouldn't it as a whole? And then we could produce goods cheaper. You know, maybe we're taking raw goods from, say, this is England. We're taking raw goods cheaper from French colonies, turned into manufactured goods. Hey, this might benefit England because then we could sell it back to the French for a higher price. So if we have free trade, wouldn't this be beneficial? Um, you'll see this, this economic questioning going uh, on in these houses, and you'll see a, some of these guys will start writing about this, these economic ideas that are discussed. Um, we won't talk about it here, but guys like Adam Smith, this Enlightenment thinker, uh, discusses things about uh, trade restrictions, lifting trade restrictions, and free trade principles. All right, so we see economic discussions among these new money people. You're also going to see scientific discussions, okay? And one thing I should point out before we go on, these guys are willing to question the way things are because they, again, are self-made. The aristocrats prior to the Enlightenment, they're educated. They hypothetically could have asked these questions. Is it better to do this, this, this way, you know, science this way, religion, politics this way? But they don't have any reason to question things because they're, the system has always served them well. You're born into wealth. You die with wealth. Why would I question things? These self-made people, these new money people, they have a reason to question things because even though they've earned a lot of money through their uh, efforts, through their hard work, they're still not considered the elites in their various countries. So you still have the aristocrats, the people with the title at the top, and a lot of these guys are going to sort of be resentful of that. Like, no matter how hard I've worked, there's still these guys above me. And, and so these guys will basically say, I don't like that. And that's part of the thing that's going to spurn uh, these various discussions. Okay? All right. So they're questioning economics. They're also going to question science. All right? So prior to the Enlightenment, the simplest explanation, and the, well, the explanation is going to be most given in uh, most of these European circles is going to be, you know why you know if you ask somebody why is uh, why does this happen you know if i drop a um a gravity might not be a good e I example but why are animals in africa these crocodiles why are they similar to these alligators people are discussing uh, or finding it in florida why uh does lightning come out of the sky and why does that kind of look similar to the static electricity that you know, when I when I walk in socks at night and touch a doorknob, why do they look similar? And people start asking questions like that. Now, some science, a lot of science already has answers at this point. It has scientific answers that up, you know, stand up to today. But prior to the Enlightenment, a lot of answers for questions, some of these complex science questions, were because God said so, or that's just the way God divinely ordained things to be. So alligators and crocodiles look this way because God made them that way. Shut up, you know. And again, these aristocrats prior to the Enlightenment didn't question that because, again, 
you know they don't, don't have a reason to question things if they're at the top of the the pyramid so what we're gonna see is these new money people these new merchant class one of the things they're gonna start to say is I don't necessarily know if I buy these ideas and you're gonna see them try to better understand na nature by trying to classify nature uh, during the Enlightenment, this is when you start seeing scientific names for various animals. You start seeing animals cl classified in families, genus, species, that type of thing. And you're going to see people, again, start performing experiments that can be repeated scientifically. Um, and, and sort of along with this, you're going to have these things like this, these curiosity cabinets. Although there have been curiosity cabinets prior to the Enlightenment, they're going to become really big in the 1700s, where you'll see Europeans import things that are curious and don't really have easy explanation. And what will happen is these Enlightenment people will start inviting guests over, and they're going to say, you know, how did this mummy come about? What, you know, what process was used to pr preserve this guy? Um, why is this creature shaped like this? What natural benefit does uh, uh, does this shape provide uh, this animal? You know, why uh, uh, is this metal different than this type of metal? And they'll start asking these various questions. Now, this enlightenment in the science is going to be most uh, uh, the biggest in the, in France. You're going to start seeing again uh, scientific classification of animals uh, start in France. You're going to see uh, these. Gardens start in France where different type of plants will be tested for their medicinal properties. Uh, you'll see animals imported into France, and this isn't exclusively France, but this is going to be the biggest area, but animals imported to see how can these be useful for humans. And again, just this broad questioning of nature. Uh, you will actually see some of the scientific enlightenment reach the uh, Americas and the British colonies. But most of this stuff's happening in Europe. One example, though, um, that you will see uh, of the Enlightenment thinking happening in the Americas is going to be this uh, British colonist, this guy, Benjamin Franklin, that's going to uh, be out of Pennsylvania, one of the 13 colonies. Benjamin Franklin is going to be the guy to test that, uh, you know, static electricity, lightning, to see if they're the same basic principles. Uh, he has this poor bastard son uh, hold a kite in, you know, with a key attached to it to, te to test um, his theory of electricity. Franklin's going to do other things. He's going to have uh, scientific tests on, let's see, uh, basically one time he thought that if you wore warm clothing in winter that you're going to stay warmer than you would if you wore light clothing, and he determined that uh, dark materials absorb heat from the sun more than light materials to test this. He'll put dark cloth on snow right by white cloth and then he's going to uh, you know, measure the depth to which uh, the snow melts under the material. You know, People had made these observations like this before but it's just now during the Enlightenment they're going to start writing them down and they're going to start testing them scientifically. So it's questioning the nature of things. And Franklin, uh, he's the only, I shouldn't say only, but he's the major sort of enlightened sci scientific thinker in the Americas. Um, again, a variety of different inventions. You can see invention come out of uh, the, the Enlightenment as people start testing uh, various scientific principles. All right, uh, there's poor uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, uh, bastard son. He's really the one that's going to hold the, the kite. All right, so you have these new money people meeting in coffee houses. They'll also meet in tea houses. They'll meet in these salons. This would be a, a salon where you have, again, merchants, stuff like that, coming to discuss things with this leisure time that they didn't have previously. So they're discussing economics and science. They're also going to discuss religion, all right? So the aristocrats, those who ruled Europe prior to this time, essentially they... They basically said, follow the principles of the Bible. Now, you're going to have some Catholics in Europe. You have Protestants now after the Protestant Reformation. Uh, you're going to have these, these various uh, different types of fallen Christianity. But the simple explanation for things is because God, you know, God did it. You know, the, God made the earth, you know, the, the seven days, that type of thing. And there's not going to be any questioning of Christianity. It's... Again, you know, different forms of accepting Christianity, but it's all Christianity. You know, in the end, this is things are the way they are because God God made them this way. Well, some of these new money people will start saying, "Is this 
actually reality. And they'll start questioning aspects of the Bible, you know, like the burning bush, Moses parting the Red Sea, Noah putting every animal on, on the boat. And they'll say, did things really happen that way? Now, a lot of people uh, will still adhere to Christianity, but they'll start saying, maybe things in the Bible aren't literal. You know, maybe we shouldn't accept things as they actually happen exactly this way. And you'll start to see people question things and say, you know, maybe we should interpret aspects of the Bible and sort of take them as analogies for, for uh, uh, something else. And you'll get a lot of people during this Enlightenment basically reject Christianity. Now, you're not going to see a lot of atheists, though you do start seeing a rise in atheism, people just disregard religion at, uh, entirely and say there is no God. Uh, but you're going to see more what you would call deists, people that basically say, I don't believe things literally in the Christian Bible. And as a matter of fact, I think there's, uh, there's a God, you know, deists would say there's a God, but he doesn't interact with human beings. He basically created the earth, and then he sort of let things go. He's divine, but he doesn't interact with humans, okay? So he's not doing miracles. He's not parting the Red Sea, anything like that. So all that stuff probably is made up, but there is a supreme being. So you start seeing people question religion. You'll see more, uh, more people becoming non-literal Christians, you'll see a lot of people becoming deists, and you'll see some people uh, becoming atheists. Again, you know, there were people like this before the Enlightenment, but their numbers are going to dramatically increase during the Enlightenment. So this is another thing, questioning religion. Along with this questioning of religion, you're going to see these, uh, 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 these enlightened thinkers also start questioning politics. So one of the cornerstones of politics uh, in the medieval ages and, and um, into the uh, modern era was that monarchs rule because God divinely ordained them to rule. So we talked about after the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe breaks up into these tiny Christian kingdoms where people use their land, uh, their money, their military might to claim an area and basically then they rule others and they tell them what to do and they govern others based on the principle that I can govern you because God gave my family the right to rule so I can tell others what to do because God divinely ordained me to and then my son whenever he comes of age he, he can take over for me uh, and he will be the ruler of this kingdom and again a lot of these guys went off and they would pay the Pope uh, to recognize a rule and then when you know nobody really questioned it because they don't have the education to question or anything and they sort of accepted this these monarchs well during the enlightenment some people are going to again be questioning religion so they, if they question God then they're going to question could God really make somebody uh, a ruler and make their divinely ordained somebody to rule others so you see some questioning uh, based on that you're going to see others questioning um, uh, politics and, and monarchs in general by saying, okay, let's accept that 600 AD or whatever, God divinely ordained your father to be a ruler. Well, what happened in a lot of these kingdoms, and it's happened in England, as a matter of fact, uh, the English king at one point gets his head chopped off in a rebellion, and then they just stick somebody from a different family on there. That happened in Spain as well. A uh, Spanish king dies without an heir. They just toss somebody from a, a different family on there. So a lot of these enlightened thinkers are going to say, even if your family was divinely ordained to rule, well, this is a whole different family. Did God come in in between their rules and basically say, okay, n now this guy's in charge? Probably didn't happen. And some people are going to start saying, if monarchies aren't, aren't the best way to rule, maybe there's a different way to rule. So can we do things better than this? And you'll see a lot of these thinkers start coming out uh, uh, guys like John Locke, things like that, will start saying, what if we could have representative government instead? And this idea of republican government. Now, this isn't anything new. You go back to Roman times and before that Greek times, and even hunter-gatherers to an extent, you have representative government. But some people will say, what if people are allowed to choose the representatives? And we see it even in the American colonies, as we, as we said. Um, and wouldn't it be better if you had representatives 
um, uh, uh, serving the people. Well, what's going to happen is, you know, more and more people will question this, and you're actually going to see some changes in politics to reflect this in the 1700s in, in uh, Europe. In England, as a matter of fact, you know, Parliament becomes somewhat more representative. You see, instead of the landed aristocrats, some of the uh, new money people will actually get into Parliament. Um, and this is going to be pervasive throughout uh, Europe. This, at least the talk about it will. So maybe Republican form of government is better than monarchy. Um, some people will go further than Republican form of government. Some will talk about democracy. And some will talk about full democracy or democratic republics. So republics representatives are chosen in some way. Maybe just by a small percentage of people in an area this person will go represent me in large government. But some people start saying what if we let the people make the day-to-day -day decisions. Others will say, all right, that's a little bit crazy, but what if we allow people, you know, just about people of a certain age, you know, to be able to, to vote for representatives, and we don't limit who can participate in the representative government. We make it a lot more broad. So some people talk about Republican government. Some people talk about making an incredibly Democratic uh, Republican government. So this is going to... Um, um, be a, a talk that's going to come out in this enlightenment all right so this enlightenment is nothing new it's throughout the 1700s it's actually going to spread throughout Europe um, and you'll see in places like England you know even though you have a king the English king's actually going to be very permitting of some of this talk so you'll actually see publications in England that say hey the king's probably not the best way to, to do things they have a, a very uh, wide freedom of press there. France, a lot of these ideas are going to get out as well. Again, probably the heart of the Enlightenment. Spain, you'll see this actually pervasive in Spain, even with this strict, uh, strict uh, absolute monarchy uh, and its devotion to the Catholic Church. They're they're not going to allow the uh, questioning the politics in there. They're not going to uh, allow the the uh, books to be published questioning religion, but they'll be open to the. Uh, things that question science, you know, uh, in economics, at least to an extent they will. And and you will see this spread throughout Europe, and especially among these new moneyed uh, wealthy people. Okay, so this is just in the background fl floating around. The Enlightenment on, alone w isn't going to change anything. Nobody's going to read a book and say, let's act on it okay something else has to happen and then when this other thing happens then we'll see people point to the enlightenment and say hey why don't we use these ideas or or now that we're upset why don't we you know adopt the principles that are put forth uh, by these enlightenment thinkers so what is it that's sort of gonna cause the main push well the thing that's gonna really upset the colonists is that in 1763, we'll see Parliament, and to a lesser extent the King of England, change the system by which it's ruling the colonies. Okay, Parliament and the King will start doing things differently than they had prior to 1763. So they're going to start pushing away that salutary neglect system where they leave the colonists alone, let them rule themselves, let them tax themselves, and they're going to start stepping into politics in ways they hadn't before and they're going to start extracting more money from the colonies than they had before and this is going to upset the colonists. The colonists are going to want to go back to the way it was before. So why is Britain going to change the system? What What's going to cause this you know, abandonment of the salutary neglect system? Well, we have our answer in the debt that's going to be incurred during the Seven Years' War. As we talked about, the British were only five million pounds in debt uh, prior to the Seven Years' War. At the end of it, they're 133 million pounds in debt. They've got to pay off this debt. They borrowed a lot of money. There are British citizens that need their money back. You know, Parliament members of Parliament, you know, are actually owed money by the British government, which is a, kind of a weird thing to think about. But these guys want their money back, and like the Lannisters, Game of Thrones reference, the British always repay their debts. So we owe these people money, our citizens money, and we want to make sure we repay them because we need, might need to borrow money from them in the future. 
how are we going to get this money? Well, at the time, Britain is taxing its citizens in, in England and in Scotland and in, in Ireland. It's not taxing its colonists, and it's not extracting much from its colonists. And at the same time, Parliament's going to look at its colonists, and it's going to say, hey, these guys, we fought this war for them. A lot of the new naval ships we, we built using the money we borrowed were sent over to defeat France there. We sent a lot of redcoats over there. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, take some money from them and sort of operate things a little bit differently and decrease the expenses that we're spending on the colony. So take more money from them and extract, uh, extract more wealth from them. So how specifically are they going to change the system in 1763? And I, I do want to point out that, again, this is going to be mainly Parliament. Parliament handles the money matters in England. Uh, the king executes them, but for the most part, Parliament's going to be the one enacting these changes. The king's going to be sort of taking a backseat. All right, so what's Parliament going to do uh, to change the system? Well, one thing they're going to do in 1763 and they're going to encode this. I don't know if encode is the right word, but in 1764, they're going to put this uh, in, in law, is they're going to start cracking down on the smuggling in the colonies. So as we talked about before, the only way the British are getting money from the colonies is whenever goods leave the colonies, there's a duty collector on the docks that will collect uh, export duties, and then whenever goods come in, they'll collect import duties uh, on stuff leaving the colonies. So whenever tobacco... Uh, wool, whatever, you know, uh, lumber, leaves, and you're about to load on a ship, a guy with a clipboard will count up how much is being sent off. He's going to collect a percentage of it, and then he's going to send that back to England uh, for Parliament to do whatever they want with it. As we had mentioned, sometimes colonists get around this. They'll bribe these duty collectors, and uh, sometimes they'll just simply avoid the docks altogether. They'll offload the goods uh, in a in a harbor, you know, a couple miles uh, up the coast and, and get around the collecting these duties. And the British knew this happened to an extent, but in 1763 and uh, even more so in 1764 when they passed the Sugar Act, the British are going to say, we can't let that happen anymore. We can't let these guys get away with smuggling because we need that cash to come in. You know, this, uh, for every bribe that a duty collector, you know, uh, collects and, and that's less duties we're taking in for every smuggler that avoids a dock. That's less duties we're going to take in. So what the British will do is they're going to put in place simple things to cut down on smuggling. One thing they're going to do is uh, start paying duty collectors more. They're going to make this a premium position. So, you know, a lot of times they'd hire it locally. So this would be, I think this is Boston is depicted here. Um, so we, get, we hire a guy in Boston. We're going to pay him a lot more so he's going to be less likely to take a bribe because he doesn't want to lose his job, which is a really nice job because he's getting paid a lot. So that's one thing the British are going to start doing. Another thing the British are going to start doing is um, taking a lot of those naval ships that they had just recently built uh, to defeat the French in the Seven Years' War, and they're going to start putting these things up and down the coast of uh, up the coast of um, the the American colonies. So you had I don't know how many new ships they built. Let's say a hundred. Instead of, you know, you don't need them anymore because you're not fighting the French, what do we do with them? Well, why don't we sta station them right off the coast of those harbors where a lot of the duty collect or those smugglers, um, uh, you know, are, are using as their, their smuggling harbors. So if they try to smuggle goods, there's a British ship here that will uh, catch them. They'll charge them with smuggling. They'll seize their ship, and they'll um, uh, put, them, uh, put them in jail. So now the next person is thinking about smuggling they saw their buddy got arrested, so they're going to decide to pay their duties. Again, this is a reasonable government action. This is something the British, uh, you know, were in their rights to do, and, and they sort of uh, looked the other way with the smuggling before, but now they need the money, so they're going to cut down on this. So we can certainly understand this, but if you are a colonist that, you know, is you doesn't like paying duties and you sort of found this uh, way around uh, smuggling, uh, using smuggling or, or bribing these duty collectors, are you going to be upset? Yeah, you're going to probably be upset. And we will see some colonists be upset with these changes. Now, this isn't going to be a huge outcry over these changes in the Sugar Act. We're not going to talk much about the Sugar Act. It, it's going to make um, certain things coming from uh, non-British 
uh, colonies and in, in not Britain uh, higher uh, put duty, higher duties on them but some colonists are going to be upset and we'll see that these colonists will you know be angry I, I need to switch to Rick and Morty or Bob's Burgers or something but I use Simpsons characters to sort of show what type of people are going to start to get upset with the British and again they're not going to be furious with the these changes but they're not going to be happy with them but business people you know like Montgomery Burns uh, people that had used to you know use smuggling now going to have to pay these duties which is going to cut into their bottom line so again you're importing stuff maybe you were importing cheap stuff from French islands now instead of getting it really cheap from these French islands just to the south of you now you got to have the goods go to England, get duties collected off them, and then you got to have them come back here, get additional duties off of them. So now instead of paying, I'm making this number up, instead of paying one pound for a pound of sugar, uh, French sugar, now you're having to pay three pounds, and uh, this is going to cut into your profits when you then sell that sugar at market. All right, so some of these businessmen are going to be upset. Some smugglers are going to be upset. Some shippers are going to be upset. Now the colonists are going to find ways around this, uh, they're going to find more clever ways to smuggle. Uh, the British are kind of hoping that, all right, you know, um, uh, they're going to choose not to smuggle because we make things more difficult. Difficult. Instead, the colonists, in a lot of instances, are just going to find better ways to smuggle. They'll come up with inventions like this, like, you know, uh, to prevent the duty collectors from seeing goods, you'll uh, carry them behind the ship, and then when the duty collectors turn around, you you uh, bring this stuff up. Or, let's say you're smuggling. Uh, and you, you uh, see a British ship come uh, come to investigate your ship, you know, they're not going to see this because it's underwater, or maybe you drop the smuggled goods, and then you come back and pick them up them later, or you have these false keels where the duty collector comes in, and he's counting up the amount of barrels you have, and, he, you know, he counts up 100 barrels, doesn't realize you have another 100 under this false false keel, stuff like that. So the colonists will accept these changes, but they're also going to come up with better ways to smuggle. All right, so this is a minor one uh, way the British are going to start upsetting the colonists, and most colonists are going to see this as, all right, this is fair. This is this is something that we understand the British government uh, has the right to do. Something that is also going to happen in 1763 that will upset the colonists is that the British are going to make a decision in Indian matters that... And it, it's going to be in Indian matters when they usually stay out of Indian affairs and let colonists handle things. So before 1763, if there was an issue with, let's just use this as an example, an Indian group here, uh, let's say, again, we see the pattern over and over, uh, British uh, settlers, they move on to uh, Indian land, uh, the they Indian hunting ground, the Indians, you know, this sure we weren't cultivating this land but that's where we uh, got our, our protein that's where we got our deer they're going to retaliate against the settlers the settlers will then arm themselves they'll usually the colonial assembly so in the case of Virginia the house of Burgesses will call up the militia and a lot of times what they would do is they would ask the British governor so the guy you know the king sends over can you give us some professional soldiers some red coats and these red coats and militia would then go drive the Indian group west, force them to sign a treaty, and surrender the rest of their land. So that was sort of the pattern. We see it over and over again. We see it in uh, all these these colonies uh, consistently. Um, same pattern over and over. British government didn't handle things, and more often than not, the British government would assist the colonists in uh, in dealing with their Indian matters. They weren't the decision makers. Well, something's going to happen in 1763 that's going to sort of change the way things are done. And this isn't going to involve the Indians of this area here, this Northwest Territory. All right, so in uh, 1763, what happens is the French are forced to leave their forts in this Northwest Territory, okay? So um, some of the forts have been taken by the British in the Seven Years' War, others... The French surrender, and the British say, GTFO, French soldiers. The French soldiers are going to pick up, leave for France. Now the British soldiers are going to occupy them. So these have previously been these French forts. Uh, at least the majority of them had previously been French forts in this Northwest Territory. And these French soldiers, when they were there, they would oversee you know, trade in the region. They, you know, uh, Fur traders would be out there trading with various Indian groups. And they weren't very restrictive. They were just to protect French territory. 
well, when the British soldiers are going to move in, they're going to institute different policies than the French. The French, when they had traded with Indians, they would trade just about anything. There's some restrictions on alcohol, but firearms, go ahead and trade them to Indians. You know, uh, there are buddies. Who cares if they get firearms, ammunition, gunpowder? Uh, because, you know, for the most part, they're our allies. The French view Indian interactions differently than the British do. Well, when the British move in, they have a different attitude towards Indians, okay? Um, again, consistently in fights with Indians, uh, negative relations uh, back and forth between the groups. So when the British move in, they no longer want to trade ammunition, firearms, gunpowder, to the various Indian groups out here. And, and these Indians, I should point out, a lot of them are those who have been pushed west by the British before. These are usually sedentary agriculturalists in these region, although, you know, a lot of scattered tribes are not nearly as advanced as Mississippi uh, culture down here. But just sort of these scattered groups, a lot of them have become Europeanized through interaction with the French. You know, so they wear European-style clothing, arm themselves with, with weapons, uh, you know, that they had acquired from the French. But now these British come in and they say, we're not trading certain things. Well, a lot of these groups have these firearms that they'd acquire from the French, but they no longer have ammunition for them. They no longer have gunpowder to operate them, so now they're useless. So these guys are going to look and say, you know, hey, we, we want the stuff that we're used to getting. And a lot of these guys are worried because, again, some of them have been pushed west by the British before, that if we don't have these guns to defend ourselves, we're about to be pushed west again. We see the pattern here. So we'll see these Indian groups in the Northwest Territory will start meeting together, and this is going to be the slow uniting. We're going to see this process throughout the next 50 years, but they're going to start meeting up and saying, well, what do we do about this? Um, they're going to have a meeting in 1763 under this guy. His name's Chief Pontiac. Um, basically, Chief Pontiac, will you call up the Indian tribes throughout the Northwest Territory and they're going to decide, what do we do? We don't like these new guys that have shown up. We want the French back. So what's going to happen in 1763 is Chief Pontiac will coordinate a massive assault on these uh, newly arrived British. So we don't want you here anymore. We want the French to return. So we're going to see this Pontiac's Rebellion. The way that this Pontiac's Rebellion will operate is basically Chief Pontiac will tell these different tribes throughout this Northwest Territory at a designated time, I want you to position yourself outside of this British fort. We'll attack this fort. You attack this fort. You attack this fort. And these different uh, Indian groups will coordinate this massive assault where they uh, destroy all but three of the British forts. So these British soldiers um, um, uh, protecting these forts are going to be forced to abandon them because all these Indian groups rise up simultaneously and throw them out of their territory. Um, not only that, we'll see some of these Indian groups start attacking settlers. Uh, a handful of settlers have been moving west of the Appalachian Mountains, and there will be even some attacks east of the Appalachian Mountains um, uh, as well. So it's this massive uh, uprising, they'll call it, rebellion, they'll call it. Uh, Pontiac and his, his people wouldn't call it a rebellion because they would call it, you know, this is our land anyway. We just want our allies, the French, back. So Pontiac's rebellion uh, breaks out. Well, some colonists are going to look at this and say, this is great. Some colonists think this is an opportunity to, these Indians have now attacked us. We can now use this as an opportunity to call up our militia, Colonial assemblies, you support us with red coats, send armies over here. We'll push these guys out of here. So we already got rid of the French. Now we can get rid of the Indians. We push them out. This is going to open up a lot of new land for settlement. This is basically what the colonists have been using to get land from the Indians for a very long time. So the colonists are almost foaming at the mouth over what has just happened with Pontiac's Rebellion, and they'll start requesting their legislatures to... Uh, to send um, uh, to, to support them by with uh, red coats. So give us some of the red coats, um, uh, send some more from England, and let's go out here and, and let's claim some of this land. Let's defeat these guys. The British governors are going to say, no. Parliament told me not to spend any money. They basically communicate with Parliament. Parliament's going to say, 
we don't want to spend money on soldiers. Soldiers cost money. We don't want to pay for new enlistments. This, in order to conduct a campaign this large, is probably going to take thousands of of redcoats. We don't think that's good. Uh, we don't want to. We don't have the money to do that. So what the uh, parliament will say to the colonists is, instead, we're going to deal with these various Indian groups. The British will simplify things here, but basically they're going to send diplomats to meet with the various Indian tribes. And what they're going to do in 1763, instead of attacking the Indians and allowing the colonists to, and pushing them west, allowing the colonists to sell their land, instead they're going to promise these Indians, we won't settle your lands, okay? I know you're worried that... Um, uh, part of the reason you attacked is because you're afraid our settlers are going to start pouring into your territory. That's part of the reason why you want the guns, ammunition, things like that. Well, we're going to make you a promise. We're not going to settle west of this proclamation line of 1763. We won't do it. We're not going to settle west of this. So you don't have to worry about us coming in because we British, uh, we're going to use our soldiers, actually. We're going to uh, reinstall our, our soldiers in some of the forts and you know maintain the ones that we were able to uh, keep during the rebellion. And basically, we're going to prevent our settlers from moving here. So you don't have to worry because we're stopping. To us today, we'd look and say, that seems reasonable. You know, you know, this is their land. We, we don't want uh, people moving in. British are making a reasonable promise here. So, modern perspective, this makes sense. But imagine you're a colonist here. You imagine you're a guy, you know, you're the fifth son of somebody. You're not going to inherit any land. Your dad had, you know, uh, moved west and claimed cheap land. His dad had moved west and claimed cheap land. The way things have been done for the past 150 years at this point is that you would move west, claim land, and push Indians west. That's how you sort of see your future. Now the British are basically stopping this with this proclamation line. No more going west. Uh, that's We're putting this to an end. Again, fair to us, but to colonists here, especially those on the frontier, that's unfair. And some colonists are going to say, wait a minute, you're making deal with a group. During this rebellion, they killed my family. You know, there, there's pretty horrific stories. You'll sometimes hear about uh, Pontiac's Rebellion where schoolhouses were attacked on the frontier. And some people that lost family members, why are you making a deal with them? Shouldn't we attack them? Again, to us with the with the uh, um, advantage of time, we say, you know, this is sort of uh, understandable. But to people at the time, it, it's going to make them angry. And it's also going to make some people angry. This isn't the way things are done. Things are supposed to be, you listen to us, we handle Indian issues. So colonists are going to be upset. And we're going to see, you know, businessmen, this is one other group that will be upset. Um, land speculators. Basically, land speculators have been looking at this territory here, hoping to remove these Indian groups, and then the Crown buys it. They buy the land from the Crown and then uh, break it up into plots and sell it to colonists. These guys are now upset because this puts an X on their plans to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains and or buy land west of the Appalachian Mountains and make a profit by breaking up this land. So land speculators are going to be upset. Land speculators are upset. Uh, colonists uh, that had planned to move west are upset. Frontiers people like groundskeeper Willie here are upset. A lot of these people don't like what the British have done. Not only that, but actually the British shortly thereafter, um, in order to appease the French Canadians, the French Canadians are qu sort of worried about the same thing happening, that uh, we're going to start seeing pressure from... Uh, uh, colonists here and they're going to start impeding upon our lands. The British want to make them happy because they don't want they, them rebelling. They don't want to have to station more troops up here in French Canada. Again, you know, they, they uh, when they took this from the French, they didn't remove the French people. So in order to make these people happy, they're going to sort of extend this line up here uh, uh, later on and basically say, you don't have to worry because this this territory is, is yours. So not only have they told the colonists you can't settle west of here, you also can't settle west up uh, up here because this is uh, French-Canadian territory. Again, reasonable to us today, but to colonists back then, you're stepping, stepping beyond your bounds, Britain. You're supposed to listen to us in Indian matters. And what we'll see the colonists do is a lot of them are simply going to ignore uh, the proclamation line They'll legally move uh, on land in the West, um, you know, just just occupy land that's not theirs, that's by treaty Indians, uh, and they're going to sell there anyway. There's not going to be enough British soldiers to, to stop them. 
Um, and also you'll see land speculators actually protest this in court, uh, proclamation line of 1763. In Britain, uh, Parliament's going to end up backing down slightly. They'll say, all right, fine, you speculators can move on to land in the West as long as you uh, uh, do a fair trade with an Indian group and you uh, get British permission to do it. So they sort of back down slightly from the colonists. So this proclamation line 1763, British, you know, upset a lot of colonists, and after upsetting them, they're going to back up slightly. Um, again, you know, we can't get all these colonists and, and force them east, and then they're going to allow land speculators to purchase lands from Indians uh, west of this proclamation line. So they back up slightly. All right, so... Still, though, colonists are going to be upset. All right, well, what else are the British going to do to uh, upset the colonists? Well, the big thing is going to come about in 1765, and this is probably going to be the major thing that will get uh, uh, most colonists saying, you know, I don't like what the British are doing. Again, a lot of colonists didn't really care about the proclamation line, especially people along the coast, which is the more majority of um, colonists. You know, this is something on the frontier. Uh, again, a lot of colonists weren't necessarily affected by the, the smuggling, the restrictions on smuggling. But what's going to happen in 1765 will affect the majority of colonists. What's going to happen is that Parliament is going to decide to, we need money. And they're going to look around and say, how can we make money? We've got all this debt we need to repay. Sure, we're cutting down on costs a little bit, you know, by, by not, you know, putting armies in the Northwest Territory, but that's not making us money back. Sure, we're slightly cutting down on smuggling, but that's not making very much money. How can we get money? Well, the British are going to determine, uh, British Parliament's going to determine the best way to generate wealth is with a direct internal tax. They'd never done this in the colonies before, but they're going to decide we need to do it. The monetary situation dictates it, that it's necessary. So what they're going to decide is to put a tax on all printed material in the colonies, or almost all printed material in the colonies. Basically, Parliament's going to determine what we, we're, we're going to do is pass this Stamp Act. So they're going to pass it in 1765, and what the Stamp Act will do is the British will hire stamp tax collectors in the colonies, and before paper can be sold, it has to be brought to these British stamp tax collectors, and they've got to stamp every piece of paper to show that a tax has been paid on it. You're not going to be allowed to sell paper unless this tax is applied. If it doesn't bear a stamp and you're selling it, you could get in trouble. So every piece of paper in the colonies has to bear this stamp. You have to basically, has to have at one point been taken to the stamp tax collector. And with the stamp tax collector, every piece of paper he stamps, he's going to take a, a certain uh, a amount of money from it. So here, you know, th these stamps, whatever, that would be six pence or something like that, two shillings, six pence. And so basically every piece of paper sold is going to have a percentage taken from it, which means that cost is then going to be uh, taken to the consumer. So before you can sell it, merchants, paper comes in to the colonies or it's produced in the colonies, not very much is produced in the colonies, but you take it to the stamp tax collector, he stamps it, and then he's going to say you owe me 50 whatever pence or shillings or something like that. And this guy, when he then goes to sell the paper, he's going to uh, have to up the cost of, of whatever he's selling uh, because because now he's having to eat this car. He can't eat the cost of the uh, the stamp tax. So you got to get the stamp tax, and every time you you um, uh, every stamp's going to cost a certain amount of tax. All right. So I want you to think about you know who this would impact. Who would be affected now that there is going you have to have a, a stamp take uh, on every piece of paper. Who would be affected by that? Well, I mean, the simple answer is everyone, and, and as we're going to talk about just every, about everyone, that's going to be true, but it's going to particularly affect certain groups, newspapers, okay? So almost all of these colonies, or all these colonies at this point, have a printing press. A couple have multiple printing presses, and these newspapers are printed, you know, daily, sometimes uh, weekly basis, 
and these newspapers are going to have to be printing on paper with the stamp. So if you're having to pay for the stamp, that's going to increase across the newspapers. Newspapers are going to have to increase their prices, which means less people are going to purchase them. So newspapers aren't going to have as many buyers simply because people can't afford it. So they're not going to sell as many newspapers. So they're going to start lo losing profits. And as we're going to see, some are going to basically say we're going to have to shut down if um, if we start selling this thing. Actually, I have a picture of this. You know, this if the stamp comes out, it's going to be the death of our of our newspaper. So newspaper men will be affected by this. Merchants, people that sell paper, you know, um, you have the small shops uh, throughout the colonies. They, they sell paper. People simply aren't going to buy as much paper because it costs more. Who else would be affected? Colonial assemblies. So colonial assemblies are writing laws. They're meeting. And the House of Burgesses meets to write a law. It's writing on a piece of paper. When it's, you know, they're collecting minutes. We discussed this. We took a vote on this. That all has to be done on a piece of paper. They're not going to be exempt from this, so they're going to have to pay uh, this stamp tax. Not only them, but lawyers. So something we haven't talked about very much, every colony sets up its own judicial system, and this is going to handle disputes in land. So Bill inherits 50 acres of land, but then Tom thinks they're, you know, some of the land belongs to him. they got to hire lawyers, and they got to settle this in a local court. Well, the guys are going to get to to dispute matters, you know, the, the law is going to be based on whatever colonial laws are set up, uh, along with old old time British law. These lawyers, they're educated, they're going to need to record documents, uh, things like that, you know, lawyers use a lot of these, they're going to be affected. Okay, so we have newspaper, media people, uh, we have politicians, colonial assemblies, we have lawyers, we have merchants. What are all those people? elites, they're all wealthy, a lot of the upper class in the colonies are going to be adversely affected by this, and they're going to be affected more monetarily than just about anybody. So this stamped tax is going to hit just about everybody, but or hit just about all the elites hard. Um, it's going to hit average Joe Schmo hard as well, because a lot of these uh, colonists, again, very literate population, you know, most people don't own books or anything like that, but a good chunk of these people can afford newspapers, and as to a lot of these people, it's their primary form of entertainment. So now the British have made your only TV show or your only YouTube videos more expensive, because again, newspapers are a form of entertainment. So a lot of uh, a comparison I like to use here uh, for what's happening with the stamp tax is, what if the government came out and said? you have to pay a 25 cent tax every time you clicked on a YouTube video or every time you watch a video on Netflix or uh, uh, you know Hulu or whatever you gotta pay 25 cents that's how we get our entertainment today you know we don't read newspapers and, and uh, books as much today but we click on that stuff all the time how many you know YouTube videos and TV shows do we watch a day you know, I I probably will do four or five myself, you know, and, the, you know, that might not be that much, but I know a lot of people, 10, 20 or whatever, it, whatever, even for me, it's, it's going to end up being uh, hundreds of, of, of dollars a month. Uh, and then, you know, even more for a lot of people, because it, it's, it's how we get our entertainment. So imagine how many, how much uh, um, that's going to cost average Joe Schmo, because that's basically what's happening here your newspaper prices uh, are going up. So think about today how people would react if the government did that. They'd be furious. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. People are going to be furious. Average Joe Schmo's furious because their entertainment, their news sources are, are going up. And the elites are going to be especially furious. So politicians like Mayor Quimby here, uh, now they're having to pay more for their documents. They write things on merchants like Apu. Uh, they're not going to have to sell uh, paper for more. Uh, people that, you know, ship goods, uh, you know, you obviously when you uh, come in and out of port, you got, you got to mark down how much goods are taken out. Uh, they're going to be upset. Media. Imagine today how Google re re would react. So Google owns YouTube. If they're learning that there's this 25% tax, that's going to drive down the number of people watching uh, YouTube significantly. You're just people can't afford it. 
So if Google heard that the stamp tax was passed or this YouTube tax was passed, before it goes into effect, how do you think Google would react? I, I imagine what would happen is every time before you click on a, or every time after you click on a, a YouTube video, instead of having the advertisement, they'd have a Google ad basically saying, tell your politicians to cancel the YouTube tax. And Netflix would do the same thing. Before you click on, or after you click on a video, before you see the, the show, tell your politicians this is a bad idea. That's exactly what these newspapers are going to do. So Parliament passes the Stamp Act, but before the stamp tax collectors can be hired, basically newspapers are going to put out, this thing's the death of us. You're going to lose your newspaper unless you tell Parliament how angry you are, unless you take action to stop this. So there's going to be this concerted campaign, see it in media, and you're going to see other politicians and uh, prominent people, what they'll do is they're going to start going out and they're going to start telling their constituents, you know, the lawyers, the powerful people around town, do everything you can to make sure that this doesn't go into effect. Just like today, you know, um, you can't watch Amazon Prime anymore. Amazon's going to encourage people to write their senators, stuff like that, uh, to get this uh, uh, passed through. We see that happen in 1765. Anybody with a voice is going to tell people, stop this from going through. This voice is going to be especially loud in New England. So in part, this is going to be because this is this enlightened area with, um, or the Enlightenment had been very big in New England uh, because there's an incredibly literate population up here. So um, we've talked about this before, owing to the Puritan influence, uh, there's a high literacy rate in New England, particularly Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, these, these former Puritan areas. Uh, as we had talked about, the Puritanism, the ardent Puritanism had died down for the most part, but you still have this focus on education, and you have a population that likes to read, and now you're directly attacking their reading, and you also have a population that is hopped up on Enlightenment literature. Particularly in New England, people have been reading these ideas about uh, government, and some people up here, they had been questioning the monarchy prior to this, and up here in New England, you know, now you're directly attacking uh, our, our, our reading. There's going to be a big movement up here to stop this stamp, stamp Act. And more people up here are also upset by the restrictions on smuggling as well. This is a big trade area. And so you're going to see a lot of uh, people here start to say, do something to prevent this from going through. This is going to be the heart of sort of this resistance to this uh, Stamp Act. Uh, politicians will start to organize protests uh, outside of British officials' houses. So I want you to imagine a scenario. This Stamp Act is passed by Parliament. They send word to the colonies and basically say, start hiring stamp tax collectors. So you're Bob Bobson. You hear this new job that's opening up. You go into it, and you a couple British officials there say, Bob, we're hiring a guy that's going to be stamping papers all day to collect this tax. We're going to pay pretty well for it. Um, are you good at stamping? Bob Bobson hears this. He's excited because he's not good at anything in life, but, man, he's not a, a good stamper. That dude can stamp like nobody's business. This job's paying incredibly well, so he gets hired to be the next stamp tax collector, and he's going to start next month uh, as a stamp tax collector. Well, he goes home, you know, tell, talks to his wife, Bobina, and his son, Bobby. And he says, Bobina and Bobby, oh, things are really going well for us. You know, old dad got a job, you know, we're going to have food on the table. Things are going to be good for us. Things are really turning around. Uh, you know, this is this is really shaping up to be... Uh, you know the the time when Bob finally finally is is able to be happy, and then right after he tells his kid and, and his wife what happened, he hears, "Bob Bobson, you suck." Like what, what was that? Bob Bobson, you're a traitor. And he looks out his window, and elites have organized a protest outside of his house. It didn't happen exactly like this, but it, it's pretty darn close. You would have these people organize these protests for people that have been hired as stamp tax collectors. And basically, these guys would say, you're betraying us, Bob, by taking this out of us. You're taking money out of our pockets. Not only would they claim that, they're going to say, 
you're allowing Britain to take on something that they hadn't done before. As we mentioned, the British had never internally taxed. This is an internal tax. So these guys are going to say to them, you're taking away our reading. You're taking away uh, our livelihoods. Uh, and again, most of these protests organized by these elites, but they're, they're organizing, you know, uh, uh, lower classes and middle class. Uh, they're not happy with it either. So they're going to go outside of Bob Bobson's house and they're going to be scaring the hell out of them. Um, they'll be uh, yelling these things. Uh, sometimes they'll be bringing these effigies. If you don't know what an effigy is, it's the straw dummies. They'll make it in the likeness of somebody. So these people in these crowds will say, Bob, this is you. And then they'll burn these things. Or like they'll throw it on the ground and like chop its head off. Like, Bob, you know, this this should be happening to you for what you're doing to us. You know, poor Bob, Bobson sitting in there holding his, his kid's eyes saying, it's not really daddy, son. That's not really daddy, son. And then uh, the people outside will be kicking down your fence. There's a lot of property destruction. Now there's not physical violence, at least not to the level where we're going to see. But people will threaten the uh, these people hired for these stamp tax collectors. So this is going to happen as a result of the stamp tax collection. And again, you could almost see that happening today if there was a 25-50% tax, uh, 50 cent tax on uh, YouTube, Netflix, that type of thing. It's not just going to be these protests that will be organized. What will happen is in colonial assemblies, so again, colonial assemblies, they handle most of the day-to-day -day matters. They're going to be telling the governors, again, the governors, Think of them as appointed by the king, but they sit there and play Candy Crush all day while the uh, colonial, the representative governments of the colonies handle day-to-day -day matters. Now these guys are going to be looking at the stamp tax and they're going to say, wait a minute, Parliament's doing what we, we, we do. All right. Now in the colonies, you would have taxes similar to the stamp tax prior to this, but that is the people that are chosen by uh, the, the, uh, the colonists. Uh, they're going to say, hey, this is what colonial assemblies are, are supposed to do. We're the, supposed to be the ones that internally tax. You, Britain, uh, only take out money and imports and exports. Now you're stepping on our toes. So what we'll see is these colonial assemblies will start protesting, and you'll see people start saying, all right, you cannot tax us unless you give us representation in Parliament. So this would be fine as long as you add seats to parliament and you allow us a say in it because we're not getting a say right now and some of these colonial assemblies you'll hear this no taxation without representation so you can't do this governor uh, uh tell parliament they're wrong um and these parliament these governors you know they got this cushy position where they didn't do anything now they're like oh crap i gotta listen to these guys uh, and obviously these guys have a legitimate complaint so uh, uh, they're going to start protesting to colonial assemblies, or colonial assemblies will start protesting these colonial governors. All right, so this is going to happen. Um, another thing that will happen is basically the elites in the various colonies, this isn't like, you know, election or anything. It's just going to be Steve in Massachusetts. He's a lawyer. He happens to know Joe in New York. Now, Massachusetts and New York, again, they're running things fairly independently of one another, both English speaking, they're both, um, you know, subjects of the king, but, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing. Well, now they're both being affected by parliament. Maybe Steve, a uh, lawyer in Massachusetts, is going to call Bob, his friend. He just happened to have met him, you know, a year before or whatever. And uh, Steve is a colonial assembly official in, in New York. He's a member of the colonial assembly. Well, you know, uh, Bob and Steve, I don't, I don't remember if those are even the right names I just made up, but they're going to start saying to one another, dude, this is really hurting my pocketbook. Um, you know, I'm, I'm having to pay more for documents. And then Bob here in New York, yeah, me too. We, we're trying to write the laws and stuff. Now we got to pay extra for this uh, stamp tax. Um, I don't like this. And then they'll call up, you know, newspaper owner John in uh, Pennsylvania, and they're going to say to him, what do you think about this? Hey, this is cutting in my profits. This is terrible. And then they'll call Merchant Joe in Virginia, and they're going to say, what do you think about it? They're actually not calling. Obviously, there's no phones. But they're going to communicate with one another. And what the various elites in all these colonies are going to decide is they're going to communicate, and they're going to decide to come together in New York for something called the Stamp Act Congress. The Stamp Act Congress to determine how how we should respond to this thing. Now, this might not seem like much. It's just wealthy dudes coming together to di discuss something. 
But what you're going to see at the Stamp Act Congress when they meet is when they come together, they're going to decide we need to do a colony-wide response to this. We need to get everybody in the British North American uh, colonies uh, together, and we need to sh act in unison to show our displeasure with this. So the elites are meet meeting up. Again, if this was today, you'd have, hell, I don't know, Mark Cuban, um, uh, Beyonce, um, a couple politicians, whatever. Anyway, you'd have a bunch of people that are elites. Mark Cuban, Beyonce, I don't know why, why those. Tom Hanks, there you go, there's another one. Uh, you have these guys meet up, and they're going to go back to um, the, their various, uh, they're going to decide we need to act in concert, go back to your colonies, and tell them we need to stop buying goods produced in Britain. So Britain is producing all these manufactured goods, sell them to the colonies. We need to stop purchasing these goods, and we also need to stop selling them our goods. So stop selling our, our raw goods. They're going to determine that we should, as a colonies, or collectively as colonies, we need to boycott British goods. So this Stamp Act Congress... Elites meet up in New York. Then the New York's uh, the elites are going to head off to their own colonies, and they're going to use their power to tell their citizens boycott British goods. Now, obviously, not everybody's going to listen to this, but a lot will, and they'll stop buying British goods produced in Britain, and they're going to stop sending goods to Britain, intending to hurt the pocketbook of the elites in Britain. And, and essentially, they're hoping that a lot of these elites in Britain, some of which are members of Parliament themselves, will then tell Parliament cancel this Stamp Act. Um, so this might not seem like much, but it's basically all these colonies coming together for the first time, which doesn't seem like a big deal to us because, you know, United States, it seems like one collective body. But really before this point, South Carolina is doing its own thing. Virginia is doing its own thing. Connecticut's doing its own thing. They're united by a language and, you know, a king, but they're they think of themselves as independent of one another. You know, the Connecticut doesn't have a whole lot in, in common with Virginia, South Carolina, with New Hampshire. But now they're going to decide we, we need to act in concert. And they're going to go back. And this boycott will actually work. A lot of people will decide to stop buying British goods, uh, stop selling goods to Britain. And it's going to get its desired effect because these merchants start complaining to Parliament we need these goods from there. They're not selling us, you know, we, I run a cigar factory here in, in London. I'm not getting the tobacco from Virginia. I run a shirt factory in, you know, wherever, uh, Worcester. I don't even know if that's a, a, a thing, but uh, we're, we're not getting the wool from Pennsylvania. Uh, York, you know, we're not getting the um, uh, whatever, uh, 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 rice. Uh, that's probably a bad example. Sugar or something from uh South Georgia, I don't even think South Georgia is good for going sugar. Whatever, we're not getting the raw products that we usually get from these places. And I'm a shirt producer. I'm, they're not buying the shirts I'm producing there, so my pocketbook's getting hurt. So, Parliament, you need to do something about this. So, end of 1765, beginning of 1766, Parliament is going to have a decision to make. At this point, I should point out, no stamp tax has been collected. Everybody that they've hired to, to uh, collect a stamp tax, like Bob Bobson, again, not a real name, but um, has quit before they've actually carried it out. So Britain, what do we do here? How are we going to get this thing done? Well, Parliament's going to decide, uh, or it's going to consider a number of different options. We could uphold this thing by force. So we're getting these colonists protests in front of these stamp tax collectors' houses, Maybe we can uh, pay the stamp tax collectors, uh, or we can send British soldiers over there, protect the stamp tax collectors, maybe pay them more so they'd be less willing to quit if their neighbors uh, come out and protest. We can uphold this by force. Well, Parliament's going to look around. If we did that, we'd have to send a lot of redcoats over there. Right now, the only redcoats we have are a handful of redcoats in these forts on the frontier. Um, we don't really want to do that. You know, that's going to cost a lot of money. All right, so throw that out the door. Uh, well, some things the uh, Br British Parliament's going to say, well, they're talking about this no taxation with representation. We can give them representation. We can allow them a couple seats in Parliament. Parliament's going to say, okay, you know, that seems like it'd be a simple solution. If we just give them a couple seats, that'd be fine. Well, they're saying, well, there's a problem with that because these guys keep growing in population. Right now they're, uh, what would they be, one 
wow, two million almost at this point. Uh, a, and right now, uh, five, six million we're, we're, we're at. What if they keep growing? Can they eventually outnumber us in Parliament? If that's the case, can they start dictating things here in England? We can't have that. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to keep them subservient to us. And they're also worried, like, if we give these colonies representation, are we going to have to give India representation? The British are starting to settle in Australia, South Africa. Maybe a tinge of racism involved there, you know, because would that mean that you're having to give uh, representation to uh, people of India or, or uh, South Africa, something like that? Uh, and then you mentioned you sort of on, on those lines, they kind of think of the Americans as lesser than uh, people of Europe. They think they're less refined. And there's some theories uh, floating around that they think they're less, just the, the environment of the Americas makes them uh, less intelligent and less uh, uh, capable of government than people in England. So we don't want to give them representation because what does that open the door for? So they don't want to do that. Well, Parliament is going to decide in 1766, after hearing these complaints, um, that they're just going to go ahead and repeal the Stamp Act. They repeal the Stamp Act. It's not going to be carried out. They say, we repeal it, forget it, we're not going to collect this tax. But when they repeal the Stamp Act, they're going to issue something called the Declaratory Act. What the Declaratory Act will say is, we can tax you, we're just choosing not to in this instance. Uh, so we can tax you, we're just choosing not to in this instance. And it specifically states, we govern the colonies in all cases. So we're choosing to repeal it this time, but we can implement it if we so want in the future. So they repeal it, but then they say we can do it in the future. All right, so Parliament repeals this, and basically they say, okay, we're repealing this one time, but we're not going to do it again. What do you think the colonists are going to say? How do you think they're going to react now the British back down once? What, what's gonna, what are they going to do the next time the British does something that upsets them? exact same thing we boycott we protest we get them to back down again so we're going to see that this is going to happen the next time britain comes up with a plan to get money out of the colonists and this is going to come about in 1767 when a guy named charles townsend uh, he's the uh, head of parliament is going to decide to come up with a series of duties um increase or increase duties on certain items to try to get the, the money out of the colonists um, on higher import and export duties. So Townsend basically looks at the situation and says they didn't like the Stamp Act because they said it's a tax and we're used to taxing ourselves. But they said we're kind of cool with duties, you know, import-export duties. So Townsend's going to determine, well, let's just increase those. If we increase those, they can't protest because they already told us their main objection is, is it's a tax. So Townsend will pass these series of duties through Parliament. You'll sometimes see these called the Townsend Acts or the Townsend Duties. And what the duties, uh, what the Townsend Duties will do is make goods like tea, paint, lead, paper, um, um, tea, lead, paper, it will increase the duties substantially. So when these items arrive on docks in the colonies, they're going to have to pay a higher duty on the goods coming in. And the thing with tea, paint, paint, lead, and paper is these are items that aren't produced in the colonies in bulk. There's a little bit of paper produced in the colonies, but tea, you simply can't grow it in the colonies. Paint, they don't make it in the colonies. Lead, the same thing. So stuff that they import and they have to import will just increase the duties then. So they didn't like that we tax the paper internally, so let's just do it bef before it gets to them on the docks. So tea, paint, lead, paper, and basically, we're thinking we'll increase the duties on that. We'll get the money back to pay back uh, the money we owe to uh, after the Seven Years' War. And they can't complain because it's not a duty. Or because it's a duty, not a tax. Well, Townsend, I mean, it kind of makes sense. But colonists are still going to be upset. And they're going to especially be upset, pretty much all colonists, about the duty on tea. So what Townsend's doing here is... Think about it, the equivalent today. We get our caffeine. Caffeine's the most popular drug in the United States today, but we get it from a number of different sources. We get it from coffee. We get it from tea. We get it from um, uh, uh, soda. The only place people got their caffeine in uh, mid 1700s, late 1700s America or uh, English colonies is uh, tea. 
now what you're doing is you're essentially in dramatically increasing the price of tea. Imagine if the government today, we don't produce coffee in the United States, maybe a tiny bit in Hawaii or something like that, but it just doesn't grow well in the United States. We import it from other countries. What if the U.S. government out of nowhere said, we're increasing the, the um, uh, duty on tea coming from Colombia and, and Brazil and wherever it comes from by 100%. So Starbucks, whereas they bought a pound of coffee, again, making up numbers here for, you know, 10 bucks before, now they're having to buy it for 20 bucks. So when you go to Starbucks, your $5 cup of coffee immediately goes up to $10. That's basically what's going to be happening with these talents and duties on tea. So you're basically going to be doubling the price. And it wouldn't just be coffee in, the, in this example. Like today it would be at the same time you know, soda and, uh, and, and tea and, and all these other things we get our caffeine from. So basically, you're doubling the price of America's favorite drug. People are going to be upset in the colonies. And what we're going to see is the exact same things that had happened to the Stamp Act happen as a reaction to these towns and acts, in spite of the fact that this is not an internal tax. It's a duty, something that the British had done since the start of the, uh, colonizing North America. Um, as a matter of fact, this, they're going to react even more violently to the towns and duties than they react to the Stamp Act. What you'll see is protests organized. Uh, you'll see people start going to duty collectors' houses. So these duty collectors living in Boston, particularly New England, but you know also Philadelphia, New York, these guys who had sort of been you know, left out of the violence in the Stamp Act because it's not a, they wanted a duty that time. But now they're going to be going home, you know, maybe it's Bob Bobson. Maybe after he didn't get the Stamp Act job, you know, and his neighbors started destroying his fence, he gets a job as a duty collector, and he's like, yeah, you know, he's working there, 1765, 1766. Nobody's bothering him. Yeah, Bob Bobson, you know, you're about to save up this money. Things are really going well for you. Then they uh, pass these towns and duties, and, you know, he's starting to collect these increased duties on uh, lead, tea, paint, paper. And he's like, okay, you know, all right, I'm doing this, but it's not a duty. People aren't going to be upset. and Or it's not a tax. So people aren't going to be upset. But he's walking home. Hey, Bob Bobson, where are you going? Um, um, who's, who said that? Hey, Bob, you know, why are you helping the British take away my tea? Um, um, I, I, I'm not. I'm just working for them. You're a jerk, Bob. And then they take Bob, they slather him in, in hot tar, and they start throwing feathers on him, uh, start uh, uh, doing things like that. Um, basically, you'll start seeing tarring and feathering of duty collectors, attacks on duty collectors as a result of these towns and duties. And I know this kind of looks funny. You know, this guy uh, looks like a chicken, ha, ha, ha. This tarring and feathering, this could actually kill you. It, it's not in the colonies. There's not going to be any... Uh, any uh, call, uh, duty collectors are going to die of tarring feathering, but in other instances it has happened. But one uh, British official that was tarred and feathered during this time, he remembered after he got tarred and feathered, the tar basically uh, stuck to his skin, and it took like uh, weeks to finally get it removed. And he said when he removed it, his skin came off in stakes. Like basically his skin came off, and he just had these huge exposed patches of of uh, uh where there was no flesh there and you can imagine you know how easy it is get to get infections because of that so you start to see actual physical violence as a result of the towns and acts as basically these these colonists say this is britain at it again a lot of americans think the british are trying to trick them by increasing um uh the duties and then they're going to come back and try to sneak in and replace it with lower taxes so basically get them to pay a high tax a duty on on paper and then, you know, they'll sneak in later and say, all right, we're lowering the duty, but we're putting in a small tax. So they think it's sort of this uh, back-end way of uh, extracting money from them. So the colonists are going to start protesting, start actually doing physical violence. Things are going to get really bad, uh, specifically in New England. And by the way, here's an example of somebody uh, tarring and feathering. This is in the uh, early 1900s, I believe. Uh, this guy got third-degree burns, and it was pretty horrific. Uh, that that's going to start happening in the colonies, and it's going to be particularly bad up here in Boston. As a matter of fact, what will start happening in Boston is uh, a lot of smugglers will start operating out of this region. Uh, what they'll start doing is they'll start going to get tea from the Dutch East Indies instead of uh, British India, where most of the tea comes in before, and they're going to start you know finding ways to get around the various uh, patrols the British have up and down the coast. 
Uh, things are actually going to get so violent up here in Boston. There's going to be so many attacks on duty collectors. The British are going to have to send in redcoats in uh, 1768 to uh, keep down the violence. This would be an organization of a protest to the towns and duties. The British are going to send in soldiers in 1768 to stamp down on the violence to basically protect the duty collectors because there have been attacks on the customs house, duty collectors are walking home. So these British redcoats are going to come in. And we're going to see that the British think this is going to stop the violence in Boston, but it's actually going to result in more violence. And what we'll talk about next time is how Boston will be the heart of this upcoming revolution.